Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Bank of the West is offering the 1% for the Planet checking account. It gives back to the planet at no cost to you, and there's no monthly service charge with any deposit per statement. Only from Bank of the West. Learn more at BankOfTheWest.com slash 1%. Additional conditions apply. Member FDIC. The Catalorette and Friends. From first love to happy ever after. What's that? From dating to dick pics. Oh my. Oh no! The Catalorette and Friends. <laughs> Oh, I love a good dick. This podcast contains sexual references, coarse language and adult themes from the beginning and throughout. It is not recommended for listeners under the age of 15. Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to The Cachelorette and Friends. I'm your host, Carla Anita Matiazzo, and today we have an Australian icon with us. George Capagnaris is an Australian stage, television and film actor and comedian. He is best known for his role in the popular sitcom, Acropolis Now, and composed the series theme song. Is that true? I didn't know that. Yep. Yep. Oh, wow. All right. Welcome yeah, they were to looking, the show, George. Uh, they were looking for someone to come up with a theme song for the show, and um, everyone was putting in things like with bazooki background fills and what have you. Yeah. It just sounded pretty corny. And then... <laughs> you know, being a kind of a bit of a muso, I just thought, well, what, what are the Greeks into at the moment? They really love George Michael, you know. <laughs> I love the police. At the time, I was a big sort of Sting fan, police fan. So, um, so I started off playing Faith, you know, jink, 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 jink with my guitar. <laughs> I started, that song, you got to have faith. And then my favourite song on the Synchronicity album by The Police was yep. a song about dinosaurs called Walking in Your Footsteps. <laughs> I, I put the two songs together and I came up with Don't worry about me, daddy. I'll make you proud of me. Amazing, uh, George. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> I went to bed. I wrote the song and then went into Crawford's the next day and I went, no, I thought of something. What is, how about this? And I went, right, let's do it. Yeah, that's it. That's the theme of the show. Oh, fantastic. That's brilliant. I didn't even know you were a musician. Is that something yeah. that's well known, George? Well, it's a fun thing. This is my, my fun release. So, music, How long yeah. have you been playing? Well, since I was 15. I think oh, I've wow. been playing it. Yeah, maybe was younger. It? So that was a school influence? Did somebody influence you at school to start playing or just? You know, at the time, you know, like, um, you know, my passion was to play the guitar because I want to be like a rock star, like, you know, guitarist on Countdown <laughs> on the guitar player. Mm -hmm. So I, in Carpentry, I made myself a guitar. Oh, wow. But, but, like bit of bits of nylon and wood and, you know, it didn't sound like a guitar, but I used to pose in front of the mirror with it. And then I thought, well, I better actually get a guitar. So, um, yeah, I did a, a few lessons, but really I didn't start learning guitar until I put a band together at school, mm -hmm. um, Scarlet. We called ourselves Scarlet. So, you know, how everyone had Beatle mania because of the yeah. Beatles, we want to get Scarlet fever. So... <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So you were even funny back then, George. I'm assuming you, you've always been funny. Really funnier then. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I really started learning how to play because I had to, you know, learn how to play to be a band. And um, from then on, it's been just a little passion, you know, an interest. Oh, that's gorgeous. And really seriously. But I've used a lot of music in my you know, throughout my 
my career as an actor and, and especially as a comedian because, uh, you know, musical parodies and music in shows is actually, you know, something that makes the show a little bit more interesting rather than just talking to a microphone all, all the time. Yeah, I find um, music connects with people on a different level. I find with my um, cabaret shows, it's helpful bringing the audience into a specific emotion that I want them to feel quicker and then supporting um, that with the story that I've got to tell. I find it's yeah. very useful. It's a story. It's, um, you know, there's so much listening to words that people can do and then they start losing concentration. You know, mm -hmm. you might be that best comedian, but they need a break every now and then and it's almost mm -hmm. like a little musical reward. You know, a lot of comedians go, oh, music, why, why use music? You know, it's a cop-out. But I, I think it embellishes the show. Definitely. Yeah, I totally agree. Guess what, lovers? The Catchalorette, there's always a catch, is back on stage in 2021. First up, The Mill, Adelaide Fringe Festival, from the 18th to the 28th of February, 7.30. Tickets on sale at the Adelaide Fringe website. Now let's get into the themes of this podcast, George. So uh, to bring the listeners up to speed, this podcast is based on the premise of my award-winning cabaret show, The Catch a Lorette. There's always a catch where I talk and sing about my first love to what I thought was happy ever after and everything in between. So let's start there, George. Can you remember your <laughs> first crush? You've been on The Bachelorette? No. No. And thinking going on it just for like research, you know. <laughs> no, no not not the Bachelorette. Nah, I don't think I fit the aesthetic. I don't have enough Botox and fillers and stuff like that. Get some. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, George. I'm good. Uh, can you remember your first crush? First crush. I think grade four. I think it was grade four. I wouldn't even know that girl's name, but um, <laughs> it reminded me of Olivia Newton-John. Nothing like her. <laughs> there's a song. There's actually a song I can. That, that it's way before physical. Let's get physical. Way before I uh, got chills. Way before that, it was mm -hmm. uh, down by the banks of the old. I think that did she do that song? I'm not sure, but. Um, Probably, I, I honestly know. love you. I honestly love. Yeah, whenever I saw that girl, I thought of that song. You know, <laughs> she didn't even have long hair. She had brown hair. I just can't remember the girl's. But anyway, that I think that was my first crush. So, what was it uh, about her, George, that made your heart skip a beat? It's funny. It's not. Sometimes it's not a look. It's a feeling you get mm -hmm. from someone. Um. But yeah, I think I was pretty smart. Oh, actually, no, she wasn't my first crush. No, I've got to tell you about my first crush. Okay, I remember now. Okay, you know, rebirthing, isn't it? The Spanish girl from the end of our street, Lucy. She was Spanish. For, they were from Spain, mm -hmm. and I uh, had a big crush on Lucy. And I would have been preschool. Wow. And Lucy was a beautiful Spanish girl, and I said. Um, I said to her, this is a quote for me, if I give you, because I had a toy gun, I said, if, you, if I give you my gun, will you marry me? I remember saying that. So, and Lucy was very fussy. So we had an outdoor toilet in our house, Richmond, little yeah. terrace. She wouldn't go to that toilet. It was too yucky for her. She just wanted an indoor toilet. But anyway, I do remember... Out the street, McGowan Street is where I lived, um, near the tyre factory in Richmond. And um, standing outside her back door, uh, as good Greek boys do, uh, calling out, <laughs> Lucy! Um, and mum had a thick accent because she, and she loved the races. She always used to go, I've got a tip for you, four and six, four and six, number four and number six. And anyway, so that was my big crush. Years later, many years later, probably about 10 years later, I get an email and it's from Lucy. Oh, and wow. She lives, 
And she goes, I've been following your progress. I've been checking out all your shows. I came to see you. Bog's out of work. Uh, you know, I'm so proud of you. Um, it, it was an honour knowing you then. And it was a beautiful letter. And it was from Lucy. Aww. I've always been out on the show. But, um, oh, yeah. That's gorgeous, George. After 40 to 50 years later, sends me this email. Uh, <laughs> so she was my first love, Lucy. Bench. Cute. Very cute. So from um, those early crushes, George, did you have a sense of what type of romantic you would be moving on to uh, your high school years? Well, I think like we talked about, I think it was just, um, it's just, again, a feeling, getting the right feeling. Uh, moving on, I think grade six, um, my first kiss was, was Anna. I used to call her Go Anna. And she was the yeah. biggest flats. So she might have been Croatian or Serbian, I'm not sure, but I wasn't going to ask her. But, um, yeah, so, and she was, she's quite pretty. She was very pretty. Um, so that so was my did, first kiss in grade so six. How did the first kiss happened. What what was the lead up to the first kiss? Who initiated what? Can you remember? Yeah, like, I think it was, like, it was like an impro game. I think it was like Lost in Space or something. Oh. And, we just, and I must have been Don because <laughs> I was single. So I was Don, and she might have been Judy. I think that was the name. Cute. Um, yeah. Is so yeah, yeah. Impro is very good. It is, isn't great. it? it they is. get kids playing footy. So um, yeah, maybe I think it's always been a feeling, a vibe. Um, and if you don't get the vibe, you basically don't pursue it. That's yeah. my feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say that you were as a teenager? Because I like to say that teenage relationships were like training wheels, learning out what your boundaries are, learning what you like, what you don't like, all that kind of stuff. Would you say that you were confident as a teenager when it came to pursuing the ladies? I was a bit dumb sometimes. You know, I just had no idea. So if a girl had a crushy on me, yeah. And I think if I had a crushy on someone, um, I'd be more kind of too shy to approach them. Yeah. So wow. I remember there was one girl, Kathy, at high school, had a huge crush on her. Mm -hmm. And I think she liked me. And we went out for a couple of days because that's mm -hmm. what we used to say. I'm going, going out with you or going with yeah. you. Mm -hmm. All we did was that together at lunchtime and didn't talk much. So that was the end of that relationship. <laughs> So she was wrong. Um, and then there was Leslie, who was a few years younger. She was in love with me, just in love with me, you know. So, yeah. But I, she was, which was really embarrassing, you know, having a girlfriend that was two years younger. My wife now is 13 years younger than me, you know. So why was that embarrassing, George? Because you were like a, a cradle snatcher. You were like, you know. It was cool to go out with someone older than you or the same age, but younger was so embarrassing. So I was a really? bit embarrassed. Even though she was my first, I think Leslie was my first serious girlfriend. Yeah, right. How long did that last for? The, probably the whole year. Oh. So I, was, I think I might have been in year 11, which was form five, and she might have been two years younger. This is, this is how dumb I was. So Leslie's called me on the phone because in those days we had like wall phones, not mobile phones. And, um, and she's giving me the hint that her parents aren't home and I should come over. Right. And I was going, no, I've got a bit of homework to do. And she's going, no, you really should come over. Like, come over. <laughs> I've gone, yeah, but um, my mum's going to get mad with me because I haven't finished and... No, you don't understand. You, now's a good time to come over. They're not home. So that's how dumb I was, you know. Other probably, you know, would have been straight there. Kind of, I just didn't get it. Didn't get well it. Well done. Well done, George. Well, at least, at least you know now that you, you had some blinkers there, some blind spots. At least you yeah. Know. Yeah. So I wasn't a sleaze bag. Put it this way. I wasn't a sleaze bag. Oh, that's know. nice. That's nice. That's good to know. 
What do you think you learnt from that relationship? Were there any lessons that you learnt from that relationship? Yeah, don't do homework. <laughs> <laughs> Would you drop, say that to your kids? No, but drop everything. Well, you know, video games, definitely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you should get out of the house, definitely. But um, I keep saying to my wife, if they, the boys want to have partners, girlfriends, I'm happy for them to come over. She goes, I'm not having those girls over here. I'm not having those sluts over here. I go, they haven't even born yet. And you're calling them sluts? How old are your boys, George? So John's uh, nine and Peter's nearly 12. He's 12 this week. So, oh, yeah. so okay, Peter's entering into, oh, he's probably already in pre-adolescent. Yeah, he's definitely yeah. into the... He has some long phone calls sometimes in his oh, bedroom. Very long. Do you, are you guys the type of parents that listen in or do you just let them do my, their thing? My wife is. I'm the hippie parent in the family. My wife is like, you know, she's the, what would you call it, helicopter parent, umbrella parent. So she's, she's got a... And she can see every conversation he's having and he comes out of his bedroom, she goes, wash your hands, please. <laughs> wash your hands. Oh, shit. <laughs> Uh, so have you had those conversations about girls yet with your boys? I encourage them. Mm -hmm. I encourage them. John, know about it. I go, who'd you kiss today, John? Oh, Dad! <laughs> hey, Evie, is she your girlfriend? Dad! I meant like friend girl, not girlfriend. Dad! <laughs> and Peter's very aloof. He doesn't want to give in, you know, any information. But Yeah, sure. But he, when he was much younger, I think he was seven, and he had his first patch when he was seven. Wow. Okay. And um, I go, how'd you feel? Like how, like, and I was many emotional. He goes, my balls went hard. Well, at least he's honest. At least he's honest with you. That's good that you guys have a good relationship. That's great. Yeah, yeah. No, so he was good. And for Tina, my, my wife was pissed off because she didn't, he actually talked to me about it, not her. That's my department. Oh, do you guys have sectioned things that you've already pre-planned you're going to talk to the boys about? Yeah. Yeah, look, that's that's great. I mean, I wish I could talk to my parents about that, those sorts of things. So, yeah. Um, so I I really encourage them to be, you know, to be open about all this stuff with me. Definitely. That's yeah. brilliant. Because I think I'm even, as you're saying this, I'm reflecting back on my, because I'm Italian, um, first daughter in an Italian family, forget about it. This topic wasn't even spoken about. Yeah. Um, yeah. I yeah. never had a second conversation with my parents. Never, you know, never. Couldn't even think about it, you know. No. Uh, going back into your love journey, George, it, from the teenage relationship, what happened after that? Did you date anybody when you left school? What was the journey from there? Finished high school. So, okay, so the main, the main um, crushes then and girlfriends, so Leslie was probably the main one, and then there was a few crushes. There was uh, um, a girl called Sarah, and we used to see, every time we used to see her, you know, because I was just too scared. She was so hot. She looked like Linda Ronstadt. Oh, right. But um, I used to sing Bob Dylan every time she was, Sarah. So <laughs> I'm sure she would have loved that. There, yeah, there was a few crushes, but I think, I think Leslie was probably the main one there. And then moving on to from high school, I went into drama school. So I went to Rusden. Yes. Uh, drama. And uh, that's where I kind of lost my virginity. Yes. Was there. Kind of. Yeah, sure. Yeah. There. Yeah. I won't say any names, but anyway. <laughs> actually, the first attempt, I made love to the sheets. I didn't even know. 
Oh, George. Oh, bless. Yeah. So, uh, oh, bless. Uh, I was like, okay. <laughs> pretty dumb. I still am pretty dumb when it comes to love. Yeah. So, um, so that was a little affair because that, that girl had a, had a fiance. Oh, she. So that was a bit naughty, you know. And, um, it's a bit cheeky, but that's drama school, you know. It's all massage and uh, yeah, it know, is. There, and one thing leads to another. Correct. And then, did I have any more luck at Ruston? No, I think I got quite sick after that. So, um, okay, I got Crohn's disease, so oh, I right. wasn't feeling wasn't feeling great. So um, that sort of stopped all that. Um, and again. Later at college, drama college, there was a girl who was interested. I actually liked this 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 girl and I actually did a course which introduced me to my friend Simon Palomaris. Right. Where and that's where I started doing stand up comedy with Simon because mm-hmm. he was in the same But there was and the only reason I did this subject was because I I liked this girl. <laughs> uh, Good reason, George. Good reason. <laughs> See, love can take you, not, you know, it can get you, get you places. It can. Um, but uh, nothing happened there. Um, but in this class, there was this other girl who was actually, her name was Barbara, and she became a famous singer and guitarist. She, she was in Paul K- and all that sort of stuff. So she was quite famous. And she was interested in me, but I had no idea. Oh, and then when I finally got an inkling, and approached her, she said, you had your chance, you blew it. Oh, <laughs> shit. That was another fail, I guess. <laughs> but And then off I went into the world of uh, stand-up comedy and then and that's that's when my luck started changing. Oh, of course it did. So you had groupies behind stage, I would imagine, George? No, just, well, I don't know. I did uh, like a, a girl that went to high school with my cousin. So she was still in high school and I was like a second year in college. So right. it was okay to be a cradle snatcher. Yeah. Uh, and her name was Anna. And then, and then Anna's mum didn't like me. Oh. So. It's uh, always tough. She pretended to have cancer so Anna could split up with me. She said, I'm sick. I think I'm getting cancer. You've got to split up with George. So she split up with me because her mum wanted to. She's a great girl too. So uh, it was one of those, yeah. Oh, mamma mia. Well, you avoided that stressful drama-filled life with that family. Well, I've been single for a very long time. So I've had a one of my, well, both of my high school boyfriends' mums did not like me. Um, And then I'm trying to think. I think my ex-fiance his mum didn't like me either yeah i think that's standard i think that's actually is it's almost like you're killing their child yeah but it's strange that you don't marry the person you marry their family as well yeah do you think that is a ethnic thing or because i don't think australians feel that way george no but look look with my with my wife you know she's if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be so in touch with my family. It's because of her right. that she's even after caring for my auntie who's, who's got dementia and she's lost her husband and she's doing all the running around. Oh, wow. You know, I'm doing it, but she's doing it. She's got nothing to do with her, you know, apart from being married to me and being her auntie through marriage. Yeah. For her to do it, but she's doing it, you know. She's the one that says to me, Hey, you better ring your mum. You haven't talked to her for a while and all that sort of stuff. So, it wasn't, you know, I wouldn't be a family man at all. Well, that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing that she's so connected with your family. And dementia's awful. I've seen two of my yeah. nonni go through that and it's fucking terrible. When they're arseholes, they're arseholes, you know, and to put up with that. Yeah. They can't help, but they do go through these stages of being yeah. nice and they're really awful. You know, someone to put up with that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty big. frightening. It was, I think, the most. Stuff is all I'm not interested. Leave me alone. 
Yeah. No. I think the the hardest thing for me as a grandchild watching my nono on my dad's side, so dad's dad, um, the hardest thing with dementia was see we understood, yeah, nono forgot who we were as grandchildren at some stage, but then seeing nono forget my dad, so like his son not being not remembering, that was fucking devastating. Seeing mm-hmm. the father forget his son and seeing how grace gracefully my dad dealt with that um because my dad's a very peaceful gentle man and how he dealt with that um was just a testament to his who he is but that was devastating as a grandchild seeing that disappear you know it's terrible yeah. to lose. <laughs> I think my first serious girlfriend I met at a, in Adelaide, oh. at um, in North Adelaide, Melbourne Street. Oh, lovely! She was working for uh, a comedy venue, and um, she was the owner's girlfriend. Oh shit! Yeah. And again, that happened a lot, didn't it? George. Uh, so then she led me to Melbourne, and. Uh, I didn't want her to follow me, but she did. <laughs> so she was my first serious girlfriend. So because you had to, you know, going over and staying over to your girlfriend's house wasn't heard of in those days. So I'd be there with um with my girlfriend, and then four o'clock I'd go. Well, I'm going home. Where are you going? Like I'm going home. Why are you going home? Because my parents will get they're waiting up for me. So which was ridiculous, stupid, and I wouldn't want my kids to do that. So intoxicated four o'clock in the morning driving home so my parents wouldn't get upset with me, which was ridiculous, but I was doing that. Oh, George. And that lasted, the first really serious series, that for about nine months. Right. Um, what made it harder, she moved in with, with Simon, my partner, business partner or oh, comedy shit. partner. Yeah. Sharing. So even if I wanted to split with, up with her, she was still there. And, and what happened is we, when we started touring, because we started getting, you know, a bit famous, yeah. um, we went to Sydney and I was doing a, sh- a show at the, the Hip Hop Club in Oxford Street in Sydney. It was like a comedy cabaret venue. Mm-hmm. The girl that was working the, the front door um, was interested in me again. But the thing I liked about her was her name. It was Peter, like P E T A. Yes. And it reminded me of well, at college she was called Peter, which I thought that was kind of strange that, you know, a girl, you know, a girl called Peter. Anyway, and she was interested in me and then eventually fell head head over heels in love with her. And then we started this long distance relationship. So it wasn't only just a relationship where you know, I had to come back home at four o'clock in the morning. I had to find an excuse to go into state to see my girlfriend. Oh, George. We married. So, um, and um, that lasted, the long distance relationship lasted for a few years, but then we got married. Yeah. Then that only lasted for a year and a bit because wow. the what was more exciting about the whole thing was the long distance Love affair. Was that a hard decision to make, that realisation of, well, actually maybe this relationship was more about the long distance than... It's just I I stopped from what Peter was telling me later on when we were kind of talking how it fell apart, is that I I lost a lot of interest, you know, and then she didn't kind of... She lost interest too. She didn't like the Greek connection well she didn't oh. she felt she was nicely by the the greek family right whereas my felt the same about her that she didn't accept them so it was just a relation but the next next relationship i had i i never introduced um tara to that was her name to my family right so my, bro- my brother, who was my little brother, who's 20 years younger than me, my only brother, got to meet her, but my mum and dad didn't, didn't meet Tara. Oh. By that stage, I was home too, so I could do whatever I want, you know, of course. Right. 
to a house with Peter and I stayed away from home. And But I regret that not introducing Tara to my family because in the end my dad died. Oh, George. So Tara in that mm-hmm. relationship, so meet her. So he... It was a nice, it was a nice relationship. It didn't last, but it was a nice relationship. It would have been nice for my dad to meet someone that I was with, that I was at the time happy with. Yeah. So, um, but that's, a, that's one regret that I've got, you know, that I, that I, uh, so that's why I feel with my kids that if they're in any relationship, you know, to not hide it from me, you know, to, yeah. I want to, Welcome that person into my home where, you know, I don't know, my boys turn out straight, gay, whatever, whoever it is that they, I welcome them into our home and treat them, with, you know, as part of the family. That's gorgeous. That's really beautiful. I love that. That's actually uh, was going to be my question to you. Do you think that's why you're so open with your boys because of that experience? And you answered that without me having to ask it. That's gorgeous. I think um, being consciously aware of the things that you want to do differently with your boys is such a gift for them and for you because you will obviously experience many different things that you didn't get to experience with your dad as a father son, you know relationship yeah well, I want to be open with them you know about everything you know and make them feel comfortable to talk to me about you know whether it be sex ed where it be about problems yep. with the part, anything I'm open to, to discussing it I don't want to kind of go no you can't talk about that you know it's dirty or it's you know it's 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 a sin or all that sort of stuff no I want to welcome that in and you know I think it's healthy for people to not have that stigma attached to them. Yeah, I think so. Cause the stigma creates a whole lot of other problems, I think. Um, and a lot of, uh, can cause trauma as well. If people are not, you know, open and, um, able to communicate with their people that are close to them in their life. I think that's really important. Guess what lovers, the catchalorette, there's always a catch is back on stage in 2021. First up, The Mill, Adelaide Fringe Festival from the 18th to the 28th of February, 7.30. Tickets on sale at the Adelaide Fringe website. Ara was a good relationship, Mm -hmm. but we never argued. We never argued. So that that, that volatile, you got to have a bit of that in your relationship, I don't know if it's spice or whatever, mm-hmm. but we never complained, and it the, the relationship really fell apart because that was missing. So the next relationship I was with the girl that worked at a nightclub that you know popped fifty eckies a night, <laughs> one of those. So I went from you know an angel to like this crazy girl. Oh you know, wow. It, Rock and roll, basically. Mm-hmm. And I introduced her to my mum, oddly enough, right. which was kind of And she was fine. Look, she was fine, but she was just a party girl. She was just that sort of... And she basically dragged me into this world of, you know, late nights and not sleeping and, yeah. and all stuff and losing brain cells. I'm sure I lost a few during that relationship. Um and that was that was that was a tough relationship that lasted for about three years. In the end, we were still living together, but we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend anymore. But I just Ooh. felt that I had that she was she used to go so hard. Oh God! Uh, and um, and in the end, the reason I didn't want to be her boyfriend anymore was, look, it's either you or me. In the end of the day, I'm going to look after you, or I'm going to look after myself. Yeah, uh, I didn't want that lifestyle anymore. Yeah. Around the time when I met my wife, mm-hmm. you know, we've been married for 16 years and known each other for about 18 years. Oh, wow. By accident. So I just met her by accident in Sydney through a friend. Yes. Who introduced me. Um, the first thing I said to her, and look, it was meant to happen because in this room, it was, I think it was called the Lighthouse. I think it was it's in King's Cross, in the corner of King's Cross and William Street. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were at this this sort of bar or club, and at the time they were shooting um, 
they were shooting the movie with Keanu Reeves and I think it was Lawrence Fishburne. I'm not sure. No, the, movie, the movie called, called The Matrix. They oh. were shooting that and they were in the room with us. And um, she chose me. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sucked in, I was, Keanu Reeves. <laughs> I was with Gary Sweet too at the time. I was sitting with Gary Sweet. Yes. And a friend of mine, Paul Danzi, and she chose me. So there you go. So Danzi made the first move. But <laughs> he's out. And then I just, all I was doing was, because Fatini was Greek and I'm Greek, I was just having a go at her. I was just staring at her about her name. Hello, Fatini, how are you? Fatini. I was just giving her the shits. I was just, and, and I had no idea there was any interest. Then we met again with my friend Ange, Lebanese girl in Sydney. Um, she's a bit of a matchmaker. Yeah. So she ended up with a But anyway, so we met again for a coffee. And then Ange invited us over at her house to watch Sex in the City. Uh-huh. And there in this, this outfit, like a white singlet, and she was tanned and she looked like Jennifer Lopez, you know. In, f- in fact, I called her a name, you know, J Lo, F Lo. And um, <laughs> I kind of, I just, you know, ding. So again, that dumb, dumb love thing. And I went, oh, she's actually quite good. nice. <laughs> I drove her home and uh, we had garlic pizza or something. And I said, I know I've got the smell of garlic, but um, can I kiss you? And that's when it started. Oh, Actually, I didn't drive you. Drove me home. That's right. She drove me home. So uh, that's when we started kind of seeing each other. Yeah. And from Fatini's point of view, she says that I wasn't meant to be a partner, just a FB. Oh, right. So how did that transition then, George? How did you go from fuck buddies to happily ever after? I don't know. (laughs) But the first time we said I love you to each other, um, I was leaving Sydney again, another Sydney girl. Yes. Go to Melbourne and she started convulsing and crying. I go, you okay? You're leaving. I go, I love you. (laughs) Oh. To calm down. (laughs) George, I'm sure that's not true. I'm sure you said it because you meant it, not to calm her down. She started coming to Melbourne and, um, you know, after about six months, I had a cat and a dog. So I had Shanghai and Juliet. Yeah. Black and white. So even though I'm a Richmond supporter, they were black and white. Anyway, (laughs) she was lying next to me on the couch was sort of lying down and I had my cat and I was patting my cat and Fatini was, was patting me and then the cat put her hand on Fatini's hand and went, hang on, he's mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so after six months, she gave me this Robert De Niro face like, so what are we, what are we doing here? You know, yeah. she put the hard word on me, you know, because again, I was happy just to, drift in and out of this relationship, but she's the one that kind of went, we get, are we doing this for fun or are we being serious here? Yeah, so, well, six um, months is a reasonable amount of time. I think she was pretty patient asking that question at six months, George. Yeah. So I, I popped the question after a year. Yeah, good man, uh, yes. In Sydney to, to get engaged. And um, But I asked her mum first before I did it. Oh. No, I asked her mum for Fatini to move down to to Melbourne with me. Yes. And um, Fatini's mum said to me, she's not moving anywhere unless there's a wedding ring on her finger. And I said, I was, was going to do that. I was thinking of that. Calm down. <laughs> and so anyway, I popped the question. Um, a circular key. And oh, a gorgeous. Argent- no. Argentina. It's called wildfire or something. Yeah. Popped the question. And um, and that's how it started. So that was 18 years, no, 17 years ago. Wow. Well, I like her mum, though. I like the ballsy response from her mum. She's not going anywhere unless you're marrying her. That's, that's, I like her mum. 13 years older than you. I had platinum blonde hair then. And she goes, he's got grey hair. 
He's a pastor. Her uncle was saying she can't marry him. It's a, a dad. So dad, you know, her uncle was going, he, she shouldn't marry an actor. He's going to cheat on her. He's going to do this to her. Oh, no. And, you know, we're still going strong. You know, we have our moments. Wrong. And very well. We have our arguments too. Oh, that's but good. at least we're honest with each other. If we've got a problem with each other, we um, let each other know. Yeah, excellent. You know, at times it's kind of quite heated. But, um, you know, it's, it gets getting better and better and better. And I think the big test for, for us was being together during lockdown, you know, yeah. in each other's for the last nine months uh, is just a test to, you know, of how good the relationship is. Yeah. Look, I've, it's interesting you say that, George, because in my Facebook feed, it's either been baby announcement or separation announcements all in my um, Facebook feed. That's what I've noticed that's come from lockdown. So what do you think through lockdown, have you found um, that you've learnt new things about each other or have things been highlighted to you that um, are strengths as a couple? What have you learnt through lockdown yeah. as a married couple? We've realised our strengths and we've, re we've realised how to be around each other, you yeah. know, if we need to leave each other alone, if we need it to leave each other to do their own thing, mm -hmm. we can do that. Yeah. You know, we don't 24 hours a day connected at the hip, you know. We can see each other for one minute in the day and still be happy or we can be together as much as we like, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it's still going strong. That's so good. I'm really... And, and, you know, before before lockdown, I'd be doing gigs in Sydney and Adelaide and taking right. off and all that stuff. And, you know, we'd hardly see each other sometimes, mm -hmm. which is easy, which is easy. But having to be with each other the whole time mm -hmm. and still be is a big test, definitely a yeah. big test. Especially when it's a big shift in how you guys usually operate with you touring a lot, George. That's right. With the kids, you know, I've realised with the kids, they need their own time, you know. You know, for teeny, like they come home from school and says, do something with the kids. But they don't want to do anything. They want to, they want to chill out and do their own thing. Yeah. You know, well, more or less you have to, it's like playing with cats, you know. You know, a dog will come up to you all the time, teeny, I guess, because I, that's, you know, I call her my little puppy because she's a bit of a puppy, you know. She likes to bark a lot. She'll so just sit on you, just plonk herself on you, you know. But the kids are like, Unless they want to come to you, you don't force them to play with you or come to you. Yeah. And big lessons learned during the last nine, nine months for sure. Is there any advice that you would give people out there in surviving lockdown with their significant others or families in general, other than the giving each other space that you just mentioned? Well, the family thing, that's a hard one, you know, that's, you know, sometimes I feel that I haven't, uh, given enough to my mum, our hands are tied. Her hands yeah. are tied too. Yeah. Um, and when I see, I know that she appreciates catching up and and um, what have you. Um, but with 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 your partner, I think that's it. You know, talking's the best thing too. How you feeling? If you're not feeling, if you're not feeling happy, if you're not, or something is pissing you off, let them know. Yeah. You know. If you don't talk about it, then things get out of hand and they snowball it into unhappiness, which probably happened with my last relationships, you know, with with maybe Peter or Tara, you know, which were my other serious relationships. Sure. If we talked about it, it would have been better, you know. I'm unhappy because, I'm unhappy because of that. But um but I've got no regrets, you know, being with Fatini's been the best thing in the world for me um, and 16 years, well, 18 years, 16 years of marriage, but 18 years has gone just like that. Wow. It doesn't feel like some people say that, you know, marriage is like a prison sentence or something. It just feels like it's gone so quickly and we've done so much. Oh, that's really lovely to hear that. That must mean that it is going really well then, George, because what's the saying? About time and things going, what, what's that saying? I can't even remember. I'm surprised when you're having fun. Yeah, there we go, that one. <laughs> that one. 
That's lovely. I think that's a great note to end on, George. Is there anything else you feel like we have not touched in these topics that you would like to share with our listeners before we sign off and I let you be free with your family? I think that's about it. Brilliant. Oh, there's one girl I dated. Because sometimes you can say the wrong things, especially I think guys, they just say the wrong thing. And there, there was this one that I dated for a few months and um, I said to her, you know what I love about you? You remind me of all my girlfriends sort of rolled into one. And when she was kind of breaking up with me, she goes, and you know that thing you said? Don't ever say that again to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great lesson. Thank you. Andrea, I think her name was. Thank you. Good job, Andrea. I think the worst thing a guy has said to me um, on a date would be, can we just hurry up and get the first kiss over and done with? Because he was so nervous. I'm like, oh, that's just killed everything. I imagine that 18 years later. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. Yeah, hence no second date after that. Yeah. Your reply, can you just hurry up and die so we can just... <laughs> Money for the funeral, I do, you know, it's like blowing it on a new car, so. <laughs> yeah, isn't that awful? I think the first kiss is, you know, that's something awesome um, at the first beginning kiss, of a relationship. First kiss, first date, proposing. Yeah. Our first date, we went to Macca's. <laughs> it's, it, was in, it was in Bondi. Bondi. Uh, not a, one of those, anyway. And um, a pretty pretty flash sort of uh, restaurant. And um, so I said to Fatini after the show, because I was doing a, a, um, a musical. Yes. Uh, what, was to my musical? Play. what was the musical? What a night. Oh, brilliant. Love that musical. It's great. Keep going. <laughs> so I was in that show. And um, she came to my hotel. And we had a few wines and, you know, we finished the bottle of wine and all that sort of stuff. And then, and then we said, oh, we've got to, we forgot to um, go to dinner. So we go, oh, what do we do now? So the going, well, I'm going home. I'm just going to go through, through Macca's. I go, can I come too? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. You don't have to be flash to be in love, you know. Oh, Sometimes. very cute. Yeah, it's the, it's the company. It doesn't matter where you are. If the company's good, then it'll be good. Yeah. Could be bread and butter and cheese and that's, you know, as long as the company is good. It helps every now and then, you know, you can't be a tight ass all the time. Correct. And, uh, James was talking about being a tight ass as well. That was brought up in our episode uh, about yeah. him telling one of his girlfriends or something in high school that, no, it was a, it was a crush that he had um, and his gift to her was a paper ring he made. And yeah, that, that sounds was, like... Yeah, <laughs> and that was to set her up for the fact that he was a tight ass in the future. If she was happy with the paper ring, then she knew what she was in for. No, I think that's the end. It's like the guy saying, can we hurry up with this kiss? There's some things you can... <laughs> what is yeah. that? Oh, man. Thank you so much for coming on today, George. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you so much and uh, all the best with your podcast and all your shows. Oh, thanks, George. Same to you with your show. I can't wait to see what you're up to. The Cachelorette with friends near and far, from heartache to catfish and sex toys. Ooh, ah. The Cachelorette and friends. See you next time if you dare. Bank of the West is offering the 1% for the planet checking account. It gives back 1% of the account's net revenue to the planet at no cost to you. There's no monthly service charge with any deposit per statement, and there's no minimum balance required. The 1% for the planet checking account, only from Bank of the West. Learn more at bankofthewest.com slash 1%. Additional conditions apply. Member FDIC. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.